and they are with the city, so don't believe we have anybody to speak. Next item on the agenda is 3A, Consent Agenda, minutes for the August 14th, 2019 regular meeting. Commissioners, any comments, questions? Pretty straightforward. Does anybody have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the consent agenda minutes for the August 14th, 2019 regular meeting as presented. I have a motion for approval. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Any other comments, questions? Or none? All right. Call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes, no nays. Motion carries. Can I get who is a second? Uh, Mr. Greenwald. All right, next item on the agenda is public hearing item 4A, ZC 2019-007. Hold a public hearing, consider and make a recommendation on amendments to the Church Code of Ordinances, Chapter 18, Building and Building Regulations, and Part 3, Unified Development Code, UDC, art including Article 3, Boards, Commissions, and Committees, Article 4, Procedures and Applications, Article 8, Special Uses and General Regulations, Article 9, Site Design Standards, and Article 12, Subdivisions. Emily. Good evening. So this is going to be kind of a joint presentation between all three of us, so I'm going to do the first couple, kick it over to Nick, he'll do two, and then kick it back to Bryce. So the first one is to the Exterior Construction and Design Standards based on House Bill 2439. So the first thing, just a general, it's relating to certain regulations adopted by governmental entities for building products, materials, or methods used in the construction, renovation, or residential, of residential or commercial buildings. It does go into effect September 1st. So what the House bill um, officially does, it says we may not adopt or enforce a rule, ordinance, building code, or regulation that prohibits or limits directly or indirectly the use of installation of a building product or material in the construction and so forth. And then the second part of it is establish a standard for a building product, material, or aesthetic method um, that is more stringent than what is allowed in a national model code such as International Building Code. So how does this affect the city of Schertz? We can no longer require a certain percentage of masonry, which we currently do. Additionally, we can no longer require a certain percentage of glazing if that is more stringent um, than what is allowed by the International Building Code or another national model code. Another item this does is we can no longer enforce exterior construction material regulations previously established through zoning applications such as a PDD. So if a, if a PDD that's in effect right now says that they have to have 80% masonry, if um, starting effect, effective September 1st, if they come in for a site plan, we cannot enforce that portion of the PDD onto them. Um, House Bill 2439 currently does not prohibit the city's regulations on articulation, so we're not proposing any changes to that. So I just want to quickly go through kind of what this actually looks like. For industrial buildings, we are proposing to remove the current regulations and add buildings must comply with the regulations established via the National Model Code. Same thing basically for, for glazing. And then, like I said, articulations, no proposed change. So what that really looks like, all of the red is our current regulations for the 80% masonry um, or the 100% on the front facade and the glazing. So this is what it'll look like now. Just the um, buildings must comply basically with what the National Model Code has. Commercial buildings, same thing. Office public buildings, the exact same code language as well. For multifamily buildings, we um, do not currently regulate glazing, so no change there. So it's just the change for the building material. And then for single family residential, we were just regulating the exterior building materials, not articulations or glazing, so just the change for that. Also in relation to House Bill 2439, it goes into the Code of Ordinances um, for the Building Code. So 
So once again, just a reminder, it doesn't just relate to the aesthetics, so the, the glazing and the masonry percentage on the outside, but it also prohibits us from directly or indirectly saying you can't use this building material in your actual construction. Basically what it says there, so you can't do that as long as it's an approved material by, the, uh, by a national model code. So currently, um, how this affects the city, we have one material um, in, that's approved by the International Building Code, cellular core pipe, that um, we had prohibited in all underground uses. We can no longer do that, effective September 1st. So what the proposal is to um, still have added stability for the cellular core pipe, which is more prone to cracking and breaking, is to require a minimum four inches of granular material to encapsulate that cellular core pipe in any underground use. So even though we still can't prohibit it, we can say if you want to use this material, you have to do the four inches to try to help um, and protect from some of that breaking. So that's basically what these code, uh, the red lines show here is just eliminating the prohibition on it and now requiring that four inches. And that's in two different sections, so it's the exact same language, um, just eliminating that prohibition. The second one that I have is um, in relation to House Bill 3371, which is in relation to fencing. So this House Bill um, is in relation to the regulation of certain battery charge fences or electric fences. So effective September 1st, the city uh, may not prohibit the installation of use of battery charge fences, which we currently do. We prohibit all electrical fences. So the proposed change for residential is just to um, eliminate the above ground electrical fencing as a prohibited material, move it into materials permitted based on the house bill. And then as a cleanup item, we thought it was a, a little confusing that, um, excuse me, the wire mesh such as hog wire, it's become increasingly more popular for residential um, uses i.e. Crossvine has it and the fence looks really nice. It's, it's becoming more popular, so we thought um, while we're doing this amendment, we'll um, no longer prohibit the um, wire mesh such as hog wire. So that changes in here as well. Now there is one correction. When um, I was creating the code language for the non-residential multifamily areas, um, I used the language that's straight out of Municode. And it turns out there is a codified am or an amendment that was done in August of last year that has not been codified into Municode. So this is what was pushed out in the packet. And this is um, what we're going to actually propose. So the only change here is to now allow the above ground electrical fencing. And then the proposed change that was talked about in the staff report, it seems a little confusing that we prohibit wire mesh here, but then we allow similar woven wire mesh. So just a clean up to just take out wire mesh. Um, and then in the packet, it was talked about allowing barbed wire for municipal use in relation to water and wastewater. So as part of that amendment in 2018, that was already done. So no need to change that. The next one will be All right, so one of the UDC modifications that had been uh, <clears throat> previously suggested in talks with city council members uh, is uh, our current regulation for automatic teller machines or ATMs. Uh, the current regulation only has <clears throat> allows an ATM if the associated bank occupies uh, space on the same property, uh, as you can see with the top of the current regulation. Um, but with more companies moving away from traditional banking methods and more uh, banks having ATMs not on the same properties as their, you know, parent bank um, building. Um, we have decided to uh, propose an amendment um, to provide convenience for residents and to allow for increased flexibility for businesses uh, that would allow ATMs with or without an associated bank occupying um, the same property. So that's the only change for this section. <clears throat> so another commonly requested UUC amendment, this time by our residents, is regarding carports. Um, the proposed UC amendment uh, for carports is for the single family residential districts. Uh, it's to allow increased flexibility for homeowners when they're trying to install a carport on their residence. Um, the current regulations uh, currently restrict um, the location uh, of carports 
uh, to be outside or to not encroach on a, a required setback via the zoning codes. Um, it also uh, requires that the carport be attached to the residence, um, be installed over the, dri over the driveway, no more than one story in height, uh, open on two or more sides, and be constructed of the same material as the primary structure. Um, so here we have a current, we have a flyer that we currently have that we recently created that's a little hard to see with on the screen um, that kind of outlines these regulations. And two that I want to point out, um, which will be subject to this amendment, are the regulation that carports shall be constructed with the same material as your home and that carports shall not encroach um, over any building setbacks. So like Emily talked about with House Bill 2439, we no longer have the ability to regulate carports be constructed of the same material as the homes. Um, so we are proposing to um, remove that regulation and we're also proposing to um, change or modify the regulation about encroaching into a required setback to carport shall be set back from the property line from a minimum of five feet. Um, the reason for the change on the setback to the five feet um, was for a couple of reasons. Number one, it more closely aligned with recent um, setback requirements for accessory structures like with sheds that we recently passed. Uh, number two, it'll allow uh, more flexibility for property owners who have been talking about this issue to install corporates on their homes. I mean, most homes are installed right up to that building setback line, so there's not actually a space for, for them to install a carport over their driveway that's outside of the setback line. That would meet all of our requirements. Um, so it's kind of prohibiting that unnecessarily. Um, and so both the, uh, these proposed amendments to the carport regulations would bring it into compliance with 2439, the new House Bill, um, and also allow for more flexibility for our residents. So kind of here is a revised flyer uh, for the new regulations that we hope to push out soon. Um, kind of you can see that the requiring the same materials is no longer there and the modified um, setback requirement to be um, set back from the property line a minimum of five feet. Work to the Public Affairs Department to create this and hopefully we can push it out pretty soon. Good evening, everyone. It's been a little while since I've seen you. Welcome back. Uh, so I get uh, the fun one, right? Uh, process changes. So I want to go over a little bit. I'm, I'm sure that all of you all read our awesome, very, very long staff report and very long packet. Um, but I want to go over just a little bit first, a, a little bit about House Bill 3167. Um, so this was passed recently, uh, and it goes into effect September 1st, 2019. Uh, it was brought forward by a representative out of Houston. Um, the bill makes a lot of changes to um, the subdivision platting and master plan process uh, as far as how it's actually processed as well as some developmental timelines. Um, and it was intended to force cities to speed up the site plan and subdivision process and also provide more information anytime the uh, plans or plats were denied. Um, and so with that, uh, one of the biggest changes that it's going to do is it, it adds language for the addition of master development plans and site plans under the context of general plans, plans, and site plans specifically. Um, prior to the passage of this House bill, none of that language existed in Local Government Code 212, which deals with uh, subdivision platting. Um, and so we didn't have those kinds of development timelines. We processed them a little bit differently, as most of you all are aware. Um, additionally, there have been changes to processing deadlines. So prior to the passage of House Bill 3167, uh, the city was required to take action on a plat. Uh, the law didn't specify what action meant, um, but we generally got them approved or denied in that time frame. Every once in a while, we would have to do a, a continuation or table with condition. Um, the other really big item that we used to be able to do is we could take a voluntary waiver of that 30-day right to action. So the applicant could say, yep, I understand this is a bigger project, it's going to take longer, I'm going to waive my right to 30 days, let's just take the time that's needed, we'll work with staff, work back and forth till it's all ready to go, then we'll list it for PNZ. Um, with House Bill 3167, um, again, that there is the inclusion of the master plan site plan to it. Uh, they do have the 30-day action, but action is specifically defined as approve, conditionally approve, or uh, deny. Additionally, uh, they limit the amount of time that an applicant can voluntarily waive that, that right to 30-day action to an additional 30 days. So the maximum that could go 
between receiving an application that's filed with an applicant waiving their right to 30-day action to uh, it being approved, denied, or conditionally approved would be 60 days. Um, additionally, the city cannot, uh, specifically stated, the, the city cannot uh, provide a timeline for turnaround on comments or revisions. So we can't say, applicant, you have to turn this back around in a business week or two weeks or whatever. It's completely up to them. Uh, and then finally, when they do resubmit based on and approve with conditions or denial, uh, the city is obligated to take action and again approve or deny or approve with conditions um, that application within 15 business day, or sorry, within 15 days of that receipt. Um, this is a brand, brand new one for us, which leads me into changes in the decision process. So historically, if a plat was denied, which I'm trying to even think of a time, I don't know that there has been one denied since I've been here in, uh, I think it was six years, actually six years this week. Um, so in the last six years, I don't think we've denied any plats, but we have approved some, we've approved some with conditions. But in theory, if somebody was to deny a plat, and typically I don't think we deny plats because Staff worked with the applicant to get it to a point where it met all the standards, makes y'all's job a lot easier. Um, but if a plat is denied, uh, it used to be it was denied, that was it, that's the last decision, and if they want to uh, make changes or anything else, they refile, file a brand new application, it goes through the review process, pay a new fee, all of that. Um, and so, one of that, that's one of the huge, huge changes in this. So what happens now is if a, if a plan or plat is approved with conditions or denied by the commission, um, staff has to provide a statement, a written statement to them specifying specifically each condition for conditional approval, which we kind of already did before, reason for denial, and they have to cite, the spe we have to cite the specific law, so regulation, ordinance, law, um, which governs that issue and it has to be relevant to that application. So for example, if somebody doesn't have two points of access into a residential subdivision, they proceed forward with it, PNZ denies it, what, you're, what we're then able to do is say, yep, you don't get it because you didn't have two points of access pursuant to this chapter of the Unified Development Code. Um, they can then take that and at their discretion, fix it, correct it, and then resubmit it back for a reconsideration by the Planning and Zoning Commission. And that's where that 15-day marker comes in. So y'all can see very quickly how our time frames of kind of working with developers get shrunk into a very, very tight time frame that we can only control our side of and can't control um, the applicant side of. Um, and so like I said, we do get that, those 15 days for that resubmittal, and so in theory, uh, well, probably would never happen in practice, but in theory, an applicant could go through an infinite amount of this revision, resubmittal, reconsideration loop, uh, which is, I'm sure, going to drive developers nuts because uh, they're like, well, I thought this was the only thing. Oh, there's another thing. Oh, well, now it's this. Um, so this is really kind of hamstrung us and tied our hands on what we can do. Uh, so with that, uh, oh, sorry, here we go. They also changed the replat hearing, uh, public hearing, and notification requirements. This is probably a good thing, um, or at least one of the better things that came out of this bill. So as you all remember, and we've had a couple of these that have come up, um, previously, if any time there was a replat for a residential subdivision or property that had been rezoned residential in the last five years, uh, we had to provide uh, a public hearing notice to all property owners within 200 feet of the original property, uh, or sorry, zoned in, subdivided into the original plat, uh, as well as public hearing notice, and I think we had to publish in the newspaper as well, if my memory serves me. But then planning and zoning holds a public hearing, uh, and unless there was a waiver or a variance, people can get up and say, I'm totally against this, but y'all are still obligated to approve it. And so that public hearing didn't really get, get anything other than telling people, hey, somebody's replatting something if you wanted to know. Um, so that has gone away, or rather been modified, so it's now only required uh, when a plat comes in with a waiver or variance request as well, um, then those would still have the notifications. So we still have the public hearings. But aside from that, uh, that requirement has gone away, which I think is going to be a little easier on everyone. So what does all this mean? It means that we have to change our process uh, for master development plan, site plans, or plats, or we risk being in violation of both state law 
um, or default approvals because we weren't able to act on items fast enough because that's the fallback. So if we miss any of those timelines that I mentioned previously, what the state has said is if you miss it, it's then deemed approved. So if we miss it on a plat, that means that plat is deemed approved in, that con in the condition that it was in. We don't want to be there. That's going to be really, really bad for everyone. I think for the most part, applicants don't want to be there either. Um, so our solution to this, and I passed out some, uh, passed out a little packet with some flow charts in it for y'all, and I will go over those flow charts here in just a moment, um, but wanted to say that's kind of the beginning. So the first part is this, is the introduction of letters of certification process. So in essence, what we're doing is pulling all of the technical review, so the review of the plat application, making sure all the lots meet the dimensional requirements, um, looking at the drainage and stormwater, looking at traffic impact analysis, um, all of the review that the various departments do, predominantly planning, um, planning and zoning, engineering, and fire, uh, but parks does also participate when there's parkland dedication. So all that technical review that happens in the background, we're now going to push into this certification process, which is going to be a prerequisite for filing an application for a plat, master plan, or site plan. So they'll go through this certification process, uh, at which point they'll submit their technical exhibits, all of the things that we need to review. City, the staff will review it, turn it around, and issue them a certification once they get to a point that it's complete meets. And so in essence, when they actually submit that formal application for site plan, master development, or plat, there should be minimal review because we will have already done all the pre-review, so we shouldn't have an issue meeting those time frames of 30 days and 15 days. Um, we doubt that we're gonna have, hopefully we'll continue where we've been and not have a bunch of denials or approved with conditions, but get people where they need to be to be compliant. Um, that staff's hope in, in this process. Uh, but it does add an, an extra layer. So, with that, we'll kind of start with the flow charts, because I know that that was probably a question that a lot of y'all had, which is, okay, I'm reading all these changes in these red lines, but it's not coming together for me. So part of that is written on purpose, so part of it is because we want to let the development manual define what needs to be submitted for each application, because things change. Um, things change as we go, and you will have noticed I cleaned up some items um, in Article 4 regarding um, application completenesses that we don't do. So for example, we don't send people mailed completeness letters anymore. We send them via email. Um, just some process changes like that, this is gonna be a similar portion. So what would happen for a master development plan? The first step is, and this will all get laid out in applications and checklists that um, Nick and Emily have been putting together all last week and this week and probably a fair amount of next week as we get it all wrapped up, is they will first go through these different certifications. So it'll be engineering, planning, fire, and then if it requires parkland dedication or includes any of that for like a residential master plan, we'll go ahead and include parks in there also. So they'll go through this. Um, each department's gonna kinda handle their own portion, issue their own comments, ultimately issue their own certification. We do have development meetings that we'll be talking about this to make sure that we're all kinda reviewing the same thing and they're not trying to slip anything in weird that we'll catch then at the application. So once they receive all these certifications, They'll submit their formal application for a master development plan. It will then get reviewed, but what that review is going to look like at that time is did the technical, did the certifications you received match what you actually submitted for your application? So it should be a pretty quick check. Uh, it'll then get scheduled for a planning and zoning commission meeting, at which point planning and zoning can approve, conditionally approve, or deny. Uh, if you deny, then it'll go into that loop, as you can see here, back where they're able to then resubmit to have it reheard. Uh, if it's approved, then they'll move on to the preliminary and final plat process. If it's approved with conditions, which is kind of a rare one for us, especially on master development plans, uh, we do have provisions written in where staff is able to um, approve the conditions so it doesn't necessarily need to come back because a lot of the times those conditions are, oh, you've got this incorrectly listed on here. I'm going to approve it with the, the condition that you fix this or things like that. Uh, so then staff can sign off on that and you're not, it doesn't have to come back. Uh, preliminary plat, again, very similar. We've got um, all four departments, again, parks would be used if there was parkland dedication involved in that one, or specifically if there was not a master plan, they went straight into preliminary plat and were dedicating land, we would need parks and parks boards to take a look at it. Um, so they go through all the certification process, we go into the preliminary plat application, 
it gets listed for a planning and zoning commission meeting and again approval conditional approval or denial with denial going back through uh, this little cycle and then that goes into final plat development certifications which is the next one so final plat again we'd go through development certifications which will be plan which will be planning engineering and fire um, they'll then file the formal final plat and also in that time engineering is reviewing as part of their certification the public infrastructure construction plans which is a requirement a prerequisite requirement for filing a final plat today anyways um, it gets scheduled for planning and zoning commission meeting and again we have approval conditional approval or denial um, if it's approved or conditionally approved they'll move forward to the public improvements installation uh, and then follow that up with plat recordation minor and amending plat again certification submittal at this point in time because it's an administrative plat it can be approved or sorry since it's a minor or amending plat it can be approved administratively what you will have noticed in the changes that were redlined is that staff cannot deny or approve with conditions any applications um, and so what this looks like is if it's approved it would be an administrative approval most of the time um, but for if any reason it needed conditions or um, staff's recommending denial on it then we would bring it back to the Planning and Zoning Commission for you all to hear the item uh, we are still stuck to that 30-day action on and 15-day uh, resubmittal action though uh, then again if it's approved they'll move forward to the building permits process assuming they have um, an item that they're wishing to develop at that time uh, finally we have the site plan process uh, again with the certifications at the very beginning uh, and this has that same decision tree where staff would recommend approval or staff would approve it and if we were going to recommend conditional approval or denial um, we would list it for hearing by the Planning and Zoning Commission prepare staff report and kind of go through that portion um, so really the stat the the new things that y'all will look at hearing are um, conditional approval recommendations or denials on site plans from staff uh, and then y'all are in the same for plats but that's kind of the way it has been for plats already uh, for minor and amending plats you'll still hear all the other things that you do um, preliminary final plats master development plans uh, and then none of the zoning cases or other items have changed at all um, so we did change a little bit in approval authority so kind of as I went over um, the first one, sorry the first one I haven't gone over we have removed the appeal process out of here there used to be a comment that appeals to plat decisions would go to City Council uh, we have removed that and so Planning and Zoning Commission y'all are the final authority on plats um, potentially on site plans and master plans as well um, and this is a, a change that that staff feels pretty comfortable with given that uh, City Council has stated on multiple occasions that they feel that y'all are the people who are the development experts in the city as far as boards and commissions go uh, so any appeal to y'all's decision would go to district court um, and then additionally as we kind of already talked about with site plans uh, for conditional approval or denial um, we would be forwarding them to the Planning and Zoning Commission I think this is my last slide a couple other changes um, you'll notice that there's some cleanup to the determination of application completeness a lot of this is just to update it to kind of current standards where we're not mailing things via USPS anymore um, it's removal of some of the hard requirements in lieu of putting them into the development manual um, and that's what you'll see with the the next one subdivision master plan application you will see a lot of things taken out we still have all those technical requirements and application requirements they're just better suited in the development manual where we don't have to take an ordinance to amend it whenever we realize like oh we don't need this anymore because something changed in our process uh, it allows us a little more freedom as staff to have some discretion in how we take things in on applications uh, we also added in vacating plat process this hasn't been in the code before um, so this was brand new but we have run a couple vacating plats and then uh, most recently this one was not in there this came up after we pushed this out to y'all on Friday um, we are going to amend to remove the reference to paving details from those three sections which deal with the uh, approval criteria and I'll read it to you in context real quick give me just a moment um, there is in the approval criteria sorry in the uh, revisions following approval of a preliminary plat that's a section 
Uh, and there's, so there's one for preliminary plat, final plat, and master development plan are those three references. There is a sentence which states, minor changes in the design of subdivision subject to a preliminary plat may be incorporated in an application for approval of a final plat without the necessity of filing a new application for approval of a preliminary plat. Minor changes shall include a revision to plat notes, revision to street or alley links, paving details, scrivener errors, adjustments to lot lines that do not result in increase in creation of additional lots or additional acreage, or changes or clarifications to easements, provided that such changes are consistent with any approved prior applications. So uh, it was kind of determined as we were doing some last minute review that paving details is not really relevant to plats at all anyways, because that comes out of the public work spec manual and is applicable to the construction plans. And so it's just not a relevant item. Uh, felt that it could just be taken out as long as we're doing this cleanup. It's kind of a quick, easy one. Uh, so with that, uh, we are all available for all the questions that y'all have on this item. All right, well this is a public hearing, so we'll open the public hearing at 631. Anyone wishing to come forward and speak? I saw that Mr. Solomon made a special trip to visit us again tonight. No comments? All right, we'll close the public hearing at 632. All right, commissioners. I got one. <clears throat> what is a cellular core pipe? Sure. And, and why the changes? Yes. So if you Google it on your telephone, and I'm sorry, I don't have a great picture. Oh, he does. Yes, I do. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to explain this in very technical terms. Okay, so when I asked Gil and one of our fellow inspectors to explain this to me, a cellular core pipe rather than being solid plastic, has little air pockets in it, which makes it uh, more prone to squishing when it's in the ground and, and being compressed. It's also, um, the way Gil explained it to me, if you drop a piece of it and it hits a rock, it tends to crack. So when you um, install it underground without any kind of barrier, he said most of the time it is gonna have some kind of crack, some kind of leak, so. And, and this is, Mm -hmm. And what would we be using that for? I'm probably for sprinkler systems, but could this be used for major plumbing in a house? From my understanding, you know? they, they could use it for any kind of plumbing installation practice. Brilliant. Yeah, it's, 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 a type of, it's a type of piping, plumbing piping, and I think it's rated, I know it's rated for drainage, and I think it's rated for potable water as well. Um, the way that they are built it basically has this, think of thin plastic outer sheath, thin plastic inner sheath, and the space in between is almost like a foam core. Um, and so as Emily was saying, it is very prone to being crushed because it's not just thick, solid, you know, like Schedule 40 white PVC that everybody's used to seeing. Um, it's also our understanding that this is not commonly used in our area anyways, um, but we do have this provision that we did write in. Now it will be. Amendment. So, and because of that, we do want to be compliant. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I did a little research because that was my question. What is cellular? It, it's, it looks just like regular PVC, and, and to answer the other commissioner's question, it's lighter and it's cheaper. Oh, and basically, so anything you can, you know, from what I found, anything you can use Schedule 40 PVC for, you can use this core PVC. My head exploded when I read this. <clears throat> um, just as a comment before my couple of questions, I am, I can't wrap my brain around the fact that the great state of Texas would make decisions unilaterally that in affect communities. I mean, we're, I know that on the almost two years that I've been here, I think a lot of the decisions that have been made are ones that are progressive and, and that, we're, that we've taken an interest in our community and what it's gonna look like down the road. And so now, if I'm understanding correctly, somebody, can, we can go back to metal buildings? That is insane. 
absolutely insane that, that we are stripped of that control of what our community is going to look like. Um, as, a, as a question, I had a couple of them. So when it comes to the approval process, if I as an individual commissioner now want to deny a, a replat or master development plan process, do I have to cite what law it's not complying with? Maybe. So the answer, yes and no. So the good news is if you agree with staff's recommendation, because typically if we bring something to you for denial, um, we're going to state in our staff report why it is not compliant. And I'll look to Dan for, for a nod or maybe a comment on this. Um, at that point in time, I, I suppose you can make a motion to deny it based on the, you know, the, in, the deficiencies listed in the staff report or something like that if that gets there. Yeah, so I, I would anticipate that through the discussion that's going to occur on the item, it's going to become evident what the what the commission is thinking is deficient about the plot or whatever it is, and 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 you're going to. We don't expect. I don't expect you to automatically know. Well, it's this section and it's this. I mean, we will have a discussion and assist with uh, whatever you're thinking and making sure we get the record correct as to what your reason for denial is based on the UDC based on chapter 212. Um, but yeah, I mean, yes, a reason has to be given. And we do have as a workshop item a little later on this agenda talking through the bylaws and some proposed amendments that we have for that, which are generated as a result of um, this process. So, so if I may chime in, because I think Bryce was very tactful in how he answered that question and Dan tried to be as well. So I'm not going to be tactful. I'm going to be blunt. <laughs> On occasion, you guys will not like something, and I can appreciate not liking it, not good for community, not consistent with where we're headed, but it's a non-discretionary item with a plat. And a few times, at least one I can think of in recent memory, we had a denial recommendation and the city attorney, his ears pricked up at that point and said, hold on a minute, let's kind of go back. Occasionally, we'll get a vote or two in denial of a plat where the rest of the commission's going to okay. This change to state law, I will say, unless you can cite that and there needs to be that dialogue with staff, the city attorney, you should not be voting against an item unless you can cite where you feel it doesn't meet code. And, and, and I'm not trying to be overly critical, but I think you kind of, kind of guys know where that happens. We need to be much more vigilant on that. We've kind of had the attitude, well, if it doesn't kind of carry the motion, it is what it is. But the reality is on these that, yeah, if, and, and that dialogue will occur. If you can't point to a spot and say it doesn't meet this, then, then you, you really cannot, particularly under the change in state law, vote against it. And, and you know, we do generally do pretty good about that. We need to be extra vigilant. Okay. Can we not just not vote? That will come. That will come up in the bylaws. So we'll, we'll talk about that one in that's, the next that's workshop. Right, let's finish the UDC before we move on to the bylaws. Any other questions? Yes, I have one, or maybe more than one. <laughs> There's a lot in here. We're expecting a lot of questions. So, in the uh, the part that talks about the application for letters of certification. I don't know if mine are the same as his. We have paragraph one, mm -hmm. then it goes to two, then it goes to three, then it goes to the big red one to four. In 4B, you make reference to subsection D1 above. If I'm in paragraph C, how can I get the D1 above? And, and there is no D1. Unless I'm misreading it somewhere. Mm, correct, it should be 4A. I apologize, it's a bad reference. We can change that. So when we make our motion, make sure we cover that. You can say, with changes, with changes as stated in, in, or, in Are you gonna record the change? It should be what, you said? Uh, I believe it should be 4A. So what it's saying is, if a letter of certification is not issued or denied within the time periods uh, prescribed, and basically it's above, which would be 4A. And I think that occurs in many different locations. Yes. And it's probably a carryover in a lot of places. It is. Yes. I can, I, I can correct that, uh, uh, that reference. 
I have another one, but I've got to find it. If somebody else wants to go ahead of me. Okay, I, I found it. In the preliminary plat process, where are we? Uh, <coughs> A, B, C, C4. It says here that the, uh, if planning and zoning does a conditional approval or a denial, the city manager or his or her designee is authorized to approve revisions required for conditional approval of the preliminary plat. Planning and Zoning Commission shall determine blah, 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 if forwarded to the commission by the city manager or his or her designee. That's not what it says in your process diagram. Your process diagram, it says if we, if we approve or conditional approval, it goes back to the Planning and Zoning Commission. It says nothing about the city manager. Yes, so the city man, it, it, and that may be an issue on the diagram. It is an Get issue on the right. diagram. It doesn't cover it. I know a couple of them, and that is on the preliminary plat. We can get that corrected. And I, I think it's common for I think for ultimately they should look uh, a bit like the, if you'll flip to the, uh, we'll redo it, but it'll kind of look a little bit like the site plan process one where it shows P and Z conditional approval and it kicks over to administrative approval, which would be staff clearing the conditions. Uh-oh. It'll look a little bit more like this where conditional approval would come down Staff will clear the conditions and then come in. But we'll probably build another bubble in there. How, so how, about, how about denial? Uh, denial goes back into the loop. So they can either take it as a denial or they can uh, offer to, to resubmit. So I think, and trying to help Bryce out since he's up here talking, so in, in looking at that, what happens is when the plat comes to PNZ, if you can, if you approve it with conditions, which, which you can do, then that statement you're reading in the code change, it lets, when the applicant then goes back to their office the next day, and they make those modifications to comply with the conditions for approval, they turn that back into staff. Staff then, city manager as designee, looks at those changes and says, yep, that's what the, those are the conditions that PNZ approved with. You've made the changes. I, I agree, I agree with you, I agree. And then we. That's not what this says. So here's what I think. And, and, I, and I don't know what authority this has or if this is part of your software that you're working on so, or if this, are, is, if this is just a guide for us. These are drafts that we've put together to help people understand the process. So again, open to all the edits on them. All right. But, and, and maybe I'm missing it then. So it comes to PNZ. PNZ then approves it or you conditionally approve it. When you conditionally approve it, it comes back to staff. Yeah, we can add a we can add a bullet. Or, or the deny it says denial too. Now the denial is this box. Right. So the denial here comes back around and comes back to you guys. Well that's not what this says. Yeah, if the, but then if they correct <laughs> it to meet, it's met, it doesn't have to go back to you. So yeah, we get we can so to be clear, I'm not sure this is an error. We can add a few more nuanced kind of sub steps, if you will to clarify what happens. But to be clear, if you deny it, then the applicant has the ability to resubmit it and then staff takes another look. If it meets now because of the particulars, then we have the ability to approve it because it's, it's um, or it comes back to you guys because of the normal process. It's only the conditional approval that once you approve it, we then have the ability to look at, make sure it meets the conditions and Are you looking for a statement about staff being able to be able to approve conditions or monitor and approve the conditions based on a conditional approval? I'm, I'm looking for consistency between between four. between this and the words. Yeah. There's not now, but it it says in the words that if we deny it, the city manager can approve it without coming back to to planning and zoning. Right. Mm, I'm reading it. 
If the commission conditionally approves or denies the plan, hold on, let me make sure I'm on the right one, not on the subdivision. Oh, nope, I'm on the subdivision master plan. Hold on, let me get one more down. I think it is as well, but let's just read it real quick. Okay. If the commission conditionally approves or denies the plat, a written statement must be provided to the applicant clearly articulating each specific condition for the conditional approval or reason for denial. Each condition or reason specified in the written statement may not be arbitrary and must include citation to the regulation, ordinance, or law uh, that is the basis for the conditional approval or denial. And then we have a portion in here after the, for the response on conditional approval or denial. After the conditional approval or denial of a plat, the applicant may resubmit a written response that satisfies each condition for the conditional approval or remedies each reason for denial. The city manager, his or a designee, is authorized to approve revisions required for conditional approval of the preliminary plat. Just, Just conditional, conditional approval. approval. So if it's denied. And, and then read the, read, the next, read the next one. The planning and zoning commission shall determine whether to approve or deny the applicant's previously denied plat or conditionally approved plat if forwarded to the commission by the city manager who's their designee. That would be forwarding a conditionally approved plat for or denial them. or further conditional approval. Because as soon as we get it back in, we have 15 days to deal with it and since staff can only approve it, if what they submitted was insufficient, then we would bring it back to the commission for reconditional approval or denial. I don't think that that will happen, it, it could, see, but it could. What, here's what I think it could. Say you approve a plat with four conditions, they then turn around and, all right, we fixed it, turn it into staff. Staff goes through and goes, you got one, two, and three. You didn't fix four. I got to run it back to you. You can reapprove it conditionally with one. It goes back through till they correct it. That's why it would come back to you on a conditional is that we haven't, they didn't satisfy everything but it the way I read it it says that if it's forwarded to the Commission by the city manager yep so he didn't have to well we have to if we're not going to approve that's it. right because we can't deny it and I can't approve it with conditions. the only thing we can do at that point from the previous sentence is approve But yes, I understand the trickiness in the words. I know Nick and I struggle with that specific sentence a little bit because we didn't want it to come off as, you know, st staff can look at resubmittals and approve or deny. So it, if it's denied and it goes back to staff, the conditions aren't fully complete. There wouldn't be conditions. If it's denied, it would be reasons for denial, and every denial will come back to you guaranteed. Every every solution to the denial would come back to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So all that staff can do on those ones that uh, we traditionally don't go ahead and approve, so if it's not a minor or an amending plat or site plan, is we can approve the conditions. So you all list conditions on it. That way it doesn't have to come back to see that it's satisfied. Staff can handle that portion. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Where do I begin? Uh, for, first of all, I'd, I'd like carports. No, I'd, I'd like. <laughs> I'd like Nick to, hasn't been up here yet. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to steal Commissioner Bacon's soapbox, and and uh, you know, as I expressed to somebody the other day, I, I realized that the legislature had made some changes, but the impact of those changes really didn't hit home until I read everything that we had to change in order to comply with them. I will tell you personally, for a long time I felt that our UDC and some of our requirements were too were, were excessive, they were too extreme. Unfortunately, I think, um, and, and it's not just us, I'm sure there was, it's more than us, but unfortunately what the legislature has done is kicked them to the other end of the court to where now they're too lax and we'll see how it all works out. Um, and I've, I've expressed the, the before that as a commissioner, I really don't like being put in a position and told that I have to approve something, okay? That's not your fault. Okay, question. Do you happen to have a picture of Hogwire? What it looks like? <laughs> no, 
I'll Google it when I get home, okay? It's typically the, the bigger square. So some, so like I have, technically I have hog wire at home and it's uh, three by three. Okay. But it can get bigger or smaller. Yeah. I and, think and you want the cross vine or? Is it, you know, was a cross vine you said? Is that where they've used it? Mm, I'll, I'll drive by there and look. That's just curiosity. I do have one though where we're modifying the, the carport requirements, okay? And that, that question is, given everything else that's changed, why did we hold on to the requirement that it be attached to the house? Why can't we allow a freestanding carport? Because, well, here, let me give, yes. you, let me give you a hypothetical. Yep. Not, I can't do one at my house because the driveway's not long enough, the, the deed restrictions won't allow it, et cetera. But, Hypothetically, my house has got a brick facade on the front. And now that you can't tell me what I build that carport out of, I may want to go buy a, an aluminum four post freestanding carport. But I can't do that because we held on to the requirement that it be attached to the house. Why? So I will do my best to answer this one. I know there is a international residential code portion dealing with accessory structures. And while we have changed that, okay. I know that Gill will consider it, when it is attached, it is considered part of the primary structure, and when it is detached, it is an accessory structure and potentially could require separation. Okay. And now I'm talking through this. Oh, I don't know that I have a great answer for you. I'm happy to go no, so I can so ask him so about I, it. No, what I will do now is to fix it. But I'll go look at the. I'll yeah. go look at the. I, I think part of it is the goal and intent when this is all drafted, and part of the citizen uh, input on this has to do with aviation heights, the older section of town where we do have some houses that have carports, some that don't. People still coming and asking for them, and our answer is, "Yep, you can't." And they're like, "But my neighbor has one," yeah. and our answer is either. It was installed illegally or it was done like a decade ago when rules were a little different, enforcement was a little different, you know, how we interpret it was a little different, that kind of thing. And uh, the goal of this is really to let HOAs still, you know, keep their neighborhoods the way they want, but open it up a little bit to the other ones to say, yeah, you can do this now, given you have enough space, much like we ran into with the sheds. Not everybody has enough space to put it on their side yard, even with the reduced setbacks. Well, I, I, could, I could put a short one in. I mean, the five foot thing helps yeah. a whole bunch. And it, it, next time I have an opportunity, I'll, I'll, I'll chat with Gil about it. That's, uh, it, I, again, just wondering. I told Nick my answer. And he probably okay. He'd want to get up and tell you. So here was a bit of it. The building code is going to require what the building code. So if it's separated and the building code says it's an it kicks into an accessory structure category and you have to have a separation, that is what it is. But you're right, we don't have to prohibit that via the UDC. We can essentially say, yeah. take that out of the UDC and let it fall to the building code and it is what it is. Okay. The reason we did not do that, in my opinion, is frankly, when we were placing odds whether this <laughs> carport thing would even get through as written, weren't sure that it would. You know, again, I'll be blunt, nobody on staff knows really why we have this provision that essentially means people in the older part of town can't put in carports other than we didn't like the way they looked and so we put this stuff in. So from a staff perspective, yeah. if you're kind of like, hey, if we're gonna jump into this way and start changing the code to allow them, then yeah, if they can still meet building code, take out the provision that says they have to be attached here, it falls to the building okay. code. We're fine with that. Well, we'll. We were trying to get yeah. something through to help and didn't want to. Okay. All right, good answer. So if y'all are comfortable and say, hey, take that out, yeah. you're not gonna get opposition from staff, we'll support that going to council. It may be something we look at late, as far as I'm concerned. I, I Again, you know, some things just kind of pop into my little brain and I Understood. need to ask. I don't need, I, you know, unless the other commissioners feel it's something maybe we can look at, visit down the road sometime. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're not opposed if that's how the commission feels, we'll certainly support it when it goes to council. Did you just say that HOAs don't have to comply with this? They can still determine their own design standards? Absolutely. How do we turn aviation heights into an HOA? 
voluntarily. Very difficult. Uh, and there's some other provisions about the state law, if you all read into them. I think we left some links at the beginning of the sections. Um, so, for example, the materials bill standard, uh, it has some provisions where it doesn't apply to recognized historic districts and some other items. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any of those in town. Um, but they, they did make certain provisions in certain areas. And it also only applies to um, governmental regulation of those items. So HOAs or private deed restrictions, et cetera, can still enforce their rules all day long. If they have material restrictions or say you can't paint your house pink, that's all still valid and enforceable. The city just can't enforce those things. So the, the restrictions, for instance, that Crossvine has on the builders can still be enforced? Yep. And so they, like, that's a great example. Crossvine as well as uh, Homestead both have architectural control committees that have to pass through for all building plans. Um, they'll still have to do that. I mean, they, they have their own civil requirements, but the city can't enforce our, a lot of our building material requirements mirrored their stuff. We just can't enforce our side anymore. So if there were his stoning, uh, historic zoning ordinances in place, mm -hmm. does that still fall under, I mean, the state's going to dictate building materials and... There are some exemptions to that due to historic districting. Um, but we don't have any of those districts. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. You have to be registered with the state. You have to do some right, other things. Right. There's a lot of resource that goes into it um, with applying for certified local government and then um, having all of that in place so that you can register historic districts. And, and the last thing I wanted to um, to ask was, um, it seems to me, and I'm sorry if I don't, I, I looked quickly for it and couldn't find it. In the, in your memo, in the staff memo somewhere, was there something about um, this was the, this new development process with the letters of certification was also being done by other some other jurisdictions? Yep. So the basis for the letter of certification. Um, was drafted by our attorney's office um, for their clients as just kind of a boilerplate, here's where we think we should go with this. Uh, we then took it, made it our own based on church requirements, some other items for shirts and tailored in. Um, it does appear in talking with our cohorts from surrounding cities uh, that they are all moving towards this. I believe San Antonio kind of already has this process somewhat in place to begin with for a number of their applications. So they're just kind of beefing their side up. Um, most of the other surrounding cities did business the same way that we do, which is just kind of submit and we work with you through it. Um, a lot of times, it, you know, to be honest, I want to say like 98% of flat applications that come in come with a 30 day waiver because they're missing one small thing and that we say, eh, don't, you know, keep working on it, but we'll start your review. I'm missing a letter from, from um, GVEC or uh, CPS or something like that, that's not really going to stop us from that review. We would take their application, but take the 30 day waiver with it to start. Um, we kind of don't even have that ability really anymore. And so we're going to be very, very strict if this goes through about you have to have a complete application. We won't be accepting partial applications because we can't take that 30 day waiver on an indefinite amount of time. And so as soon as we take it and take that application as filed, then our clock starts. Um, and the risk on a lot of these things is too high for us. Uh, and that's why you'll see, you know, and I'm sure you, nobody's mentioned it yet, but the 90 day initial time frame is a very high number. Um, we don't anticipate it taking that long. We anticipate it kind of taking as long as it takes right now, which is anywhere from two to four weeks, depending on how difficult the application is typically. Um, but we need that extra buffer just in case. So if we get swamped with a bunch of work or out a bunch of people, you know, we need that padding to make sure that we can ensure these comments get out uh, and that we don't have things that are kind of just declared as being approved because we lapse in time frames. So if I could just chime in on this just a little bit, just for full disclosure. So Habib Khan in our office is, has remained good friends with folks within the San Antonio City Attorney's Office. He, he used to be within the office. And, uh, and, and Habib, develop the template for, for us to, to roll out, okay, just to San Antonio area. The thought being that uh, this, is, this is already the way we know San Antonio is going to move on this. 
And most developers who develop in the greater San Antonio area uh, don't, it's not in a vacuum, right? So they're, they're already developing within San Antonio's jurisdiction. This keeps it fairly uniform within surrounding communities. Now, having said that, I will tell you that um, San Anton the San Antonio region is, is really being the most aggressive on pushing these, pushing these timelines back on the developer. Um, I can, uh, we have offices in Houston and Harlingen and Austin, and I can tell you for a fact that Austin area is not so much doing the San Antonio model. Uh, they're trying to be a, what they call a lot more developer friendly. And so our template is not being adopted or used outside of this region. So there are other ways people are doing this. I, I concur with your staff, and I, I like the way that the San Antonio region is approaching this. Um, but but when you go to when you go to the Texas APA conference and you talk to your your peers from other places, you're going to hear a lot of different ways this is being dealt with. Uh, so I don't want I don't want to I just don't want y'all mis, being misled that that you know we came up with something that's universally beloved. It's not. It's it's just not. Uh, San Antonio is kind of doing their own thing, but but it's collectively seems to be the approach this whole region's taking. So. Well, I guess I'll, I'll just start with the, the comment that uh, in, in a state that uh, likes to uh, profess its freedoms and liberties for its citizens, the fact that the state has taken away our ability to uh, control a lot of what happens is, is very disappointing. Um, yeah, even though I do agree uh, with some of what Glenn said that in, in some respects, I do think that our UDC was too restrictive, but this swings the pendulum way too far the other direction, in my opinion. Um, and that, that said, let me get address a, a couple of questions that I have. Um, with the electric fencing, we had a uh, case come through, I guess, last year with a trucking company that wanted to put up an electric fence around the perimeter. So based on these changes, that would now be permitted. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, what is going to happen with current applications that are in process right now when the new law goes into effect? Which rules will they have to play by? So that depends. So the platting, the process application, mm -hmm. everything that is in process can continue in its existing process. That will only apply to things beginning September 1st. Uh, luckily, we have a submittal calendar for a lot of these things, and I think the first submittal day isn't until the following Monday. Um, so we're good then anyways. We are looking at taking this to city council next Tuesday um, for an emergency reading, so it will go into effect that evening, assuming it's approved. Um, did you already talk about buildings? Yeah, so, so we talked a little bit about um, how we can't retroactively um, apply uh, the regulations for like a PDD. So similar to what Bryce was talking about earlier, Crossvine, even though their HOA can still regulate how their houses look, we cannot. Um, we can't enforce the Crossvine PDD. That also applies to applications that we have in right now that we've been reviewing as they have to have the 80% masonry, they have to have their 30% glazing effective September 1st. We can no longer require them to have that masonry and that glazing percentage. So Crossvine, though, just, just to interject, though, Crossvine's in a TERS. Is it, is it that the one? So I say we can. Yeah, we can do it through the TERS. And we don't, we don't have to approve that. I mean, any, any time we have a regulatory authority and there's money attached to it, like your EDC can enforce anything they want as a condition of getting money, and, and I think you, and you can on a TERS as well, or PID or anything such as that. Development agreement, and so yeah, we've got the ability to stick in as part of that. Yeah, we'll work with you on that, but here are our standards regulations that run. All right, let me scroll through here. I had a couple other things that came up. Uh, Let's just add a little level of complication to it. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, that was the offense. Uh, uh, I answered that one.
page 42 of her packet. It's page, uh, I guess, 16 of the UDC mm -hmm. portion. Uh, down to bottom, it has paragraph two which, in red lines, which are stricken out. Planning and Zoning Commission review of administratively approved plats. The city manager or his or her designation shall provide a quarterly report. And we yes. That out. Yes. So that was included in here. Um, we are currently issuing these things out, you know, as we go during meetings. Um, I don't know, staff, we've been a little behind on um, pushing out the. Um, monthly financial report, but that's typically where we also put in um, approved items. Instead of putting it in the UDC that that's the requirement, we would rather have it as a policy that we issue you these things out, and we'd like to do it as they're done. So as we approve amending plats and things like that, we'll be including copies of that with your packet instead. All right. And I guess the only other question I have is, just based on y'all's experience, you know, the, the impacts, especially of 3167, I, I personally kind of see it as it's potentially going to generate more work for us, stuff coming through here with denial, re reconsideration, and, and... So so there's a couple things that we're, we're hopeful for. Um, so we are still working out and grasping all, a full understanding, and I think it'll probably take a couple months, even once we get into this, for us to really understand and then tweak the process as we go. Um, but we are planning a couple outreach events to, to bring in developers um, and engineers and people who've done business with us over the last couple years to say, hey, here's this opportunity to come in. Let's talk you through these changes. Let's talk you through some perceived best practices that we have. You know, so you're going to get these different certifications from these different departments who may be issuing comments separately. You know, a good best practice is to wait till you get all of the comments on your project from all the departments make all the changes and then resubmit. So then what you resubmit to fire matches what you resubmit to engineering instead of it being separate and having to continually amend. Um, and we'll walk people through a lot of that. We'll probably put a guide together. It's gonna be a lot of public outreach that we're gonna have to do to, to really capture how this changes and, and help people through the process. Because again, our goal isn't to jam people up with this. We'd love to get it through as quick as possible. Um, the faster we get it through, the faster they will start building a win-win for the city it's win-win for the developer um, and so we want it to be as quick as possible review wise we think there's still going to be kind of the same amount of review maybe just a little bit more but not much but yes application processing there will be more of that um, but we're also looking at with this changing some of our application procedures and planning to start taking things digitally um, which we've been doing on the permit side for um, the better almost a year now um, and it's been going very well, and we've learned a lot of lessons from that one. Uh, so we'll have less, hopefully less lessons to learn on the planning side. Um, but that should open up some of our, our, our internal processing of paperwork to be a little bit faster, uh, which will hopefully impact us a little bit less. But yeah, we're not, we're not quite sure what that impact's gonna look like until we get really into this and are able to start generating some metrics and understanding. I don't mean to get too far in the, the weeds on this, but so, now we've got this this very tight time frame on getting this approved. What happens if we don't have a quorum? Does that mean if if it's we've we've come down to the wire on that deadline, it's approved? That's what that means. Holy cow! Yep. And so you know attendance is going to be a big issue. That's why we you know that was a big item that came up in the bylaws discussions mm -hmm. um, last year. Um, you know, we, we do have a PNZ um, alternate. We may even look at adding a second one on if we're having attendance issues or things like that. Um, but yes, that's exactly what that means. Our goal as staff is to not wait that 30 days because in theory we will have already done all this pre-review. We'll be ready to go. And the ones that we're like real shaky on, like, ooh, this isn't going to make it, we'll probably try to get out even earlier just to make sure that we don't run into those kinds of issues. But, you know, absolutely. So we already have submittal deadlines for certain things. We'll probably have deadlines for resubmittals as well since we have 15 days to act on it once they resubmit. Um, just to make sure that it corresponds with a PNZ meeting. Because there's some times where we go, uh, we'll go three calendar weeks without a PNZ meeting because of how it falls in between. Um, it's not rare. It happens like once a year when it happens. But we just, we've got to make for those provisions. Otherwise, we'll run into 
a point where we do get something and there isn't even a PNZ meeting for 15 days. But then with also us pretty much traditionally only meeting once in November and December, Correct. Uh, that we would be looking at potentially calling special meetings. Yeah, or just amending the calendar. And we're just going to kind of hold people to the feet to the fire on that. You can only submit on these days because they correspond with hearing dates. So uh, we are very, very hopeful, though, that the development community, I'm sure, is, does not like the extra level. Uh, staff, we're not overly fond of it either, but we're kind of all sitting in this boat riding it together. We're going to make the best of it and kind of walk everybody through because we don't want it to add a whole bunch of time to everybody's project. We don't want to drag it all out. You know, ideally, this adds maybe a week or two at most, uh, which would be that it's the middle of the formal application, staff's quick review, and then listing on a PNZ meeting. But I guess just a, a informational request from staff or the city attorney. I'm, I'm just kind of curious to see what like Austin or Houston are doing, and if you have a rough draft or something that you could send out to me. I'm just kind of curious to see how they're handling it. Just. For, for knowledge purposes. All right, does any? I got a couple of quick questions, and, and I didn't see anything in here about mandatory HOAs. Are we still going to mandate it? So, an HOA, so typically the only times that we ever have HOAs pop up, which is all in almost every single new residential subdivision, is to deal with community owned land or sorry, neighborhood owned land, so drainage ways, um, sign, signage lots, landscape buffer lots, et cetera. Um, if there was a subdivision that didn't need any of those things, they wouldn't need an HOA. Uh, they probably may not even create one. It's completely at the developer's discretion. Go the other way. We've got subdivisions that require this stuff that HOAs went out of business 40 years ago. Yep. I don't know what to tell you, Mr. Greenwald. I mean, yeah, no, I, I'm aware. I mean, there's, there's property that the, cities, that the city mows or deals with because the HOA is absentee, um, or it's still in the developer's name, and they're absentee at this point. Uh, you know, that's a, it's an ongoing item that we deal with as a city as a whole. Um, you know, we're happy right. to add that list. Add right that to now the list we don't group. mandate HOAs. Correct. We do not mandate them. We don't review their documents. If there is common owned property that's non-buildable lots, we do require typically for them to kind of let us know how they're planning to handle that to make sure that it's not going to turn into an issue. Um, you know, I wouldn't want a ton of space for an HOA that has like five properties in it. Five properties won't ever be able to pay enough to maintain it, right? You know, and we kind of look at things like that realistically on a functional perspective to make sure that there's not kind of bad deals going down. Um, our drainage department engineering is really good about that because I think they're the, some of the ones that have been burned the most uh, in the past. Um, but as of now, we're not looking at changing that. All right, any other questions on the UDC topic? All right, I guess we'll move on to the bylaws. Uh, just real quick before we get started on that. We do need action this evening on Well, it, uh, the item 5A says consider and make a recommendation to council regarding an amendment to planning and zoning and commission, zoning commission bylaws. Uh, it doesn't say. Yeah, we need to do 4A first. Right? Oh, 4A. Oh, yep. Yeah, we're on 4A. Yeah, we yep, sorry. I thought, we, I thought we put them together separately. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I was, I was, yep. <laughs> it's 4A. All right, so yes, uh, we, we do need to uh, have a motion to uh, uh, recommend or not recommend to council on this. We, ha we, had, we had what you submitted. You read something that's not included in our packet, correct? Yes, so if you want a motion for approval, you can say a motion for approval with the discussed changes. The staff <laughs> will take care of that and explain it to city council when we get there. Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> you know, given that I feel we have no, we really have no choice in this, I'll make a motion that we uh, recommend approval to City Council 
of uh, ZC 2019 and I can't read the number anymore. <laughs> zero, zero, 007. Zero, zero, 007. All right, I have a motion for a recommendation for approval. Do I have a second? Well, I, I have enough trust in staff that they'll fix it. I, I don't feel the need to spell that out in my motion. I'll second. All right, first and a second. Any other comments or questions? All right, call for a vote. Nay. Aye. 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 Five ayes, one nay. Motion carries. Okay, now item 5A for an individual consideration. Consider make a recommendation to City Council regarding an amendment to the Planning and Zoning Commission bylaws. And just again, as I was about to start there, um, before Bryce gets going, uh, as I reviewed this, uh, one of the things that I did catch is that uh, uh, terms expire on May 31st and that the election should be held the first meeting in August. Uh, for some reason, I had in my head that we were doing that in November. Uh, so we need to make sure that we schedule our election of officers at our next meeting. We have caught that. Uh, Ms. Emily caught that, and it is scheduled for the first meeting in September. Thank you. We figured that we didn't need to clutter this meeting with that stuff as well, not knowing how long it would go. So uh, we will be having elections uh, or scheduled elections for the first meeting in September. Right. And then we have set ourselves a calendar reminder. As it used to be, I think, two-year terms. Yes. And we would miss it all the time. So yes. uh, Emily has sent out a calendar reminder to all of staff so that we'll catch it at the first meeting in August going forward. Um, so for this item, what we're looking for, uh, ultimately any changes to the bylaws come to as a resolution, uh, but we feel it's important since you all typically govern yourselves and propose your own bylaw changes um, that we receive a recommendation from you all on this. Basically, the changes that you're seeing in front of you, the red line changes, are to remove the ability for an abstention unless you have a legal obligation against it, such as a conflict of interest. Um, and so what this will do is this will force you um, to vote on items, all items. Um, get down to it, sorry. Um, and that's basically the, the end goal uh, of what this is. And I will, I will give you a couple items real quick, and then I'll get off my soapbox. So, um, we always appreciate as a city your your volunteered time, because uh, you don't get paid to be up there. You're also not elected to be up there. You just volunteer to be up there. Um, we do appreciate that. Um, however. The duties that you have been assigned, especially when it comes to plats, and if you read local government code, there are some very specific items. You are duty bound to approve plats which meet all the criteria, whether you like them or not. Um, that's y'all's obligation. Uh, and so there shouldn't be abstentions at all ever on plats, and by extension now, master plans and site plans uh, for anything, unless you have a legal conflict of interest or other legal obligation, at which point you would be recusing yourself at the beginning of the item, so you wouldn't, and you'd step down from the dais, so you're not participating in the discussion, you're not participating in the action. Uh, because you step down, you're removed from the quorum on that item, um, whereas right now, if you abstain, that's the same as saying a no vote, and that's the way that the bylaws treat it. The issue with that becomes, if we don't state reasons, and sorry, the other one in here, I apologize, is a change which requires you to um, in your motion, if, you're, um, if you are motioning for denial, in your motion to list the reason for denial. Um, so typically, if you're agreeing with staff, we will have already listed reasonable reasons. Um, this is something that's very important across the board because both on all the items that we just talked about, staff's now going to have to issue out a letter saying this is why and this is what the commission said. And so we have to have that for the record on here. Historically, we've not been the greatest of pushing y'all to that point. Um, more recently, I think we've gotten a little more on to everybody about it. Um, the other one is that we also get at times is from city council asking why there were dissenting votes on a recommendation, let's say for a zoning case or things like that. There are frequently times that someone won't talk but they'll vote against something, so I have no reason to give city council. My answer is, yep, 
I'm assuming they're agreeing with the opposition in this case, but I, I can't tell you. And so it's really important for us to be stating those reasons, especially in recommendations for um, you know, denial being forwarded to the council, but also in motions for denial on um, now Platt's site plans and master plans. So with that, I hope that kind of makes sense to y'all. Yes, it's not ideal. I'm sure that you don't like the ability to not just abstain and say, I don't want to vote, but you really are duty bound to vote. That is your job up here is to say yes, no, or yes with conditions on things. So with that, I'll answer questions and be quiet. All right, well, I guess uh, we start with a question for the attorney here. Uh, I think I've probably been impacted the most on this. As previously, I've been given guidance to recuse or abstain myself from votes involving the cross line because I'm within the 200 foot notification zone. But as I understand it, I do not have a legal obligation to abstain because I have no financial interest. So some guidance on how to proceed moving so that, forward on that. That's, that's not exactly true. So the way, the reason for a 200 foot notification area is because the legislature and their infinite wisdom has decided that people within a 200 foot uh, notification area are impacted differently from the rest of the community. So that is a financial impact that's specific to people within that area that is different from the general public. Okay. So that would actually be a conflict of interest um, if you're within, that's the interpretation, if you're within that 200 foot notification area, that that can be deemed a conflict of interest. So, um, but at the end of the day, a conflict of interest decision is yours and yours alone. Uh, nobody can make you abstain and claim a conflict of interest. Uh, I don't advise individuals whether or not they have a conflict because that's an individual decision between you and your personal attorney. I can advise you as I just did as to how that's viewed uh, generally within a 200 foot notification area. But ultimately, uh, it's any commissioner that has to make that decision. Okay. It, it would be different if I was employed by Crossvine, right? That, that would make a difference. It's a, it's a different reason to abstain. <laughs> that, sure, it's a, you're, I mean, yes, it's a different reason. You now ha are an employee that has a direct financial incentive as opposed to a property owner uh, whose property is impacted differently than other property owners who aren't within 200 feet. Same, and the same provisions apply on platting uh, as far as conflicts of interest and when you abstain on a, on a plat. Yeah. And, and so what we're saying is not that you can't, that you have to participate in those votes, but if you're going to have that conflict that you say, I'm not going to vote on this item, that you recuse yourself from the dais for that item. So then you're not counted in the vote as a, as a yay or a nay and reduces the quorum by one, assuming that this you know, doesn't break quorum. But again, if we have seven people, we shouldn't, in theory, we shouldn't run into that issue very often. Well, so, and, and here's a little bit more to it, right? So here's the, here's the, here's the true concern. And, and other boards already deal with this. Boards of adjustment deal with this because they're quasi-judicial bodies and their appeals have always gone directly to the district court. But uh, y'all are smart folks. You can do math, right? So you know how important your vote is. If you haven't voted yet and they're, calling the, and they're coming to you for a vote and you, and you realize that, well, if I, if I just don't vote, uh, this can't pass and you give no reason the problem with that is if we go to court that's arbitrary and capricious because we have no legal justification for the abstention uh, there was no discussion you didn't file a, a, a statutory conflict of interest form and so we're all just sitting here wondering why uh, and there is no other conclusion other than it's arbitrary and capricious you just decided that well if I don't vote uh, this doesn't pass and that's going to be problematic for you as, a, as an individual as much as it's going to be problematic for, for, for us. Uh. Where, it will, where it will be an issue, Mr. Chairman, is when we only have four members present. That brings another question that is about this, but it sort of reverts back to the, uh, the previous discussion that it takes four affirmative votes to move, is that just zoning issues or is that any issue before the commission? There's a provision in there somewhere that it, it takes at least four affirmative votes to move. Sure, through. so it depends, a lot of times it's by application. There are certain things that come in that state law has for 
simple majorities of quorum versus super majorities, and we have a couple things that are written into our UDC related to that as well. Um, like I know, actually, but the zoning stuff won't make a difference for y'all because you're going to be simple majority for your recommendation. But what I'm wrestling I with. I think there are appeals and there are times of legal protests with replats which require a specific amount. Um, and well, I do know that our, the local bylaws, and I, and I will refer back to the y'all who were on the mini bylaw committee for this as to why we still had it not as a floating percentage of the quorum, but as a percentage of the sitting body. Where I was going with this, Bryce, is, is, is all of this new legislation and, and the new procedures that if I only have four folks up here and I get three eyes and one nay, my understanding is that issue then it's 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 not approved so how does that how do we get back then does that mean that it's then automatically approved because we didn't deny it okay. so the way that the law is written is failure to deny or approve with conditions in the time frame means that the item is approved is then i think it says specifically it's deemed approved well, actually, in, the, in that scenario, it's denied. If it takes four for approval, you have three eyes and one nay with specific reasons why I'm voting nay, yeah. then it's denied. It's not okay. It's denied. Well, that brings up what uh, Mr. Burrow and I were talking about earlier today. Uh, do you want to run with the football? Well, the, these are just regarding... Uh, these are just regarding the motion process and the chart that that you submitted with us in the bylaws where it says uh, there's a column that says affirmative vote by four members, yes or no, and where it says yes, if our minimum quorum is four and an action or a, an amendment or a postponement or some motion by a member requires a vote and it requires four voting members to vote for it, if somebody doesn't want that action and they vote against it, it what you said it right, Michael. What what was it? It basically enables one individual to hijack the item under discussion. Yeah. And so I I, I was gonna bring up that we change that column to just say a majority vote as opposed to a vote by four members. Because basically with a minimum quorum of four, it would take four eyes, everybody voting yes. I don't know if that's included in what you were talking about, Glenn. So for, for uh, the attorney is, are, are we, I guess, is there any statutory requirement that with seven appointed board members that we have to have four votes on something? The only place that I could think it may be is in the charter. And I don't know, we've not, I've not looked there. And I don't know if it's I don't know anybody who's like, well, the, quick recall comes the, off the, the charter. The, the, yeah, the, the charter reference to planning and zoning is, is refers back to state law. Okay. So it, it's a thank you for pointing out that that's on the chart. And But now that I look at it, a, a motion to approve or deny would fall where? Down there at the very bottom where it says to take action? Correct. Okay. And you see, my concern is just that I don't, I don't want to Absolutely. get into this automatic, I don't, I don't want something to drop into this automatic approval bucket. I, I agree with that. Is there anything preventing us from making that change to a majority? Our, Happy to do it. Our attorney is looking at his book. <laughs> okay. And ultimately, what we'll, what we'll probably look at doing, if it's, if it's amenable to the commission, since this doesn't actually need a, a, re a formal recommendation for all and run through as a, as a resolution city council, um, staff can do some back checking just to make sure that there's not an issue uh, as we take it to council and if there is we can explain the issue to council and kind of let them sort through it um, kind of knowing that y'all are in support of the of shifting the four votes to be a majority 
as opposed to four, obviously four of seven, right? Um, so it'll be a majority of quorum. We can write it like that. And then, so assuming that y'all are good with that and good with the uh, proposed changes by staff regarding um, abstentions and motion language. Right. So here's, here's an issue though with what yeah. you just said, because you said a majority of the quorum, but you have seven members. So you can't have three of seven. If you have everybody here and the quorum's four, you can't write it as a majority of the quorum, or you'd have three people approving items in a, on a body of seven. Well, we're saying, say you had only had four people attending that night. Right, so you're, you're trying to write an exception, though, where the, 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 the votes needed to pass something is going to change based on our ability to get you all at a meeting. And that shouldn't be the case. I mean, it just shouldn't be the case. If the, if the board is seven, then the approval should be four. That's why we have uh, alternates as well. But if you do it any other way, you're going to have less than a quorum, le less than a majority of the membership of the governing body approving things. Uh, the approval should be a majority. Of, of the governing body, of this governing body, which is seven, and that's four. Are the governing bodies present? No. I won't agree to that. I, won't, I, won't, I will not recommend to the council that they make that change. That's not what their rules are. That shouldn't be what your rules are. Because that's, that's, that's a vote of three of seven. If everybody's in attendance, we're going to say, okay. Because we can't have it. We can't have two separate. We can't have it be two separate numbers based no, what, on our ability to attend. What I, what I was talking about was if we only have four members present, which is a quorum, we can conduct business. Should, on, yeah. on all of these actions, it says all four of us have to vote. That is yes. correct. Yeah. Why, why can't we just have three out of three out of four? That's a majority. Yeah, I think what the attorney is saying it needs to be a majority of the total body, which is seven. So here, here's what I would say. What I'm Regardless gathering of how many are of here. the commission is we have something pop up where we're missing a few folks, and now we're down to a smaller than normal body, um, and and that then it becomes real problematic if one person doesn't kind of look at at in and follow what's required. Um, and, and so what I would suggest then, and this is ironic given our previous discussions, is that if that's a concern, that what you do is you appoint a couple more alternates, yeah. and that's now you reduce the likelihood that you don't have a larger number of folks at the meeting, maybe not seven, but typically six. And then the other thing, and I'll be real honest here, is because of this change in state law, while it's not been a real big deal if we've had somebody kind of doesn't make all the meetings, that really kind of changes. And PNZ really becomes this body that, yeah, stuff will pop up, but if you're only gonna make half the meetings, PNZ's probably not the board for you. Yeah. Well, I happen to settle on it, you know, the number four, because that's our minimum quorum. Yeah. Without four, we can't have a meeting. But I'm sitting here listening, and, and you know, we could just easily have five here and two vote, you know, three, and you know, and it, you get a three-two vote, and we yeah. still don't get that that number four. It's fine. It's fine. Well, it's okay, if things fail, because you're, it's only it's only a final decision on plats, and they just go right back around through the process. They just kicks it right back. The the zoning items go on to planning, and they go on to the city council. City council. And given the new requirement, then, and and just to clarify, it's not just if I move, if I make a motion to deny, I have to say why. It's also if I vote nay on a motion to approve, I have to give a reason. Correct? The the new law. So so the no. So if you are, what it says is for for plats that are conditionally approved or denied we have to give written explanation as to the conditions of the conditional approval or reasons for denial as well as their basis and the basis can't be arbitrary or capricious so it has to be based in law what would what i believe would happen if you had a motion for approval that failed you would then have to have the inverse of a motion of de to deny and so whoever was up there of your four people who said nope i'm not voting for this they get put on the spot and they need to justify and y'all are going to hold them to that you, get a motion to you know you, you basically here you go why did you deny this they got to come up with something that's not arbitrary if they do come up with something that's arbitrary i'm sure city council is going to be paying attention to this more now and they may not be there very long makes sense it may get replaced but Bryce, the, the 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 reality is is that 
the, the cure to any of this is discussion. Discuss what's before you. Have a full and honest and open discussion as to what you're thinking, where you're headed, if you're in favor of it or not in favor. That can all be discussed on the dais. That can be discussed out loud, uh, where it's on the record, where everybody knows what's being thought of up here, and it can be fully discussed. The proponent can come back up. Staff can, can chime in. But just because a motion fails doesn't mean the floor is closed to further motions. If I make a motion to approve and we don't get four votes, we discuss it further. Maybe the next motion isn't a motion to deny. Maybe we discuss it further. I say, okay, so what is your issue? What are you having trouble with? Because either, either I'm going to make another motion to approve and we're, and we're going to have this discussion and you're going to agree, or you're going to have to make a motion to deny. Tell us why you're voting no, uh, if you didn't state why the first time. But the, the key in all this is just open discussion because we're building a record because either we're going to the district court if it's a plat or it's going on to the city council if it's not, but we need a full record. Question. So in F1 motions, the requirement that I provide a citation to the regulation ordinance and or laws required by the UDC, mm -hmm. that only applies to these items, correct? So unilaterally, if I say nay to something that's not one of these items, I still have to provide a reason why I denied? Yes. For so, everything. Yes, it, which you should, correct? So, so follow me through this rationale. So somebody comes in with a zoning case or a comprehensive plan case, right? That ends up with you making a motion for denial. Why are you making a motion for denial? And if it's just because you don't like it, well, that's an arbitrary and capricious reason. And that's not a justification for it anyways. Now, if you say things like, well, this zoning case, in my opinion, doesn't meet the comprehensive plan because comprehensive plan says this, as staff has told me, there's your reason. It's not compliant with the comprehensive plan. I'm recommending denial. You know, but you, you can't get into a portion where you're recommending denial because you don't like the business that's going to come in afterwards like we someone almost ran into several months ago. Um, because ultimately, that's not what our zoning code is written for. Our zoning code is written in broad strokes for types of land uses, not specific business operations. But, but again, just to clarify, the, 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 the new law, that's, I make a motion to deny, I have to say why. Uh, if you but vote if, to deny, I, I, I don't, look, I, well, I, wanna, let, I wanna let, talk, let me finish, because, Dan. Well, because motions to deny, are not good procedural no. things to do. We don't, I, I don't, and I don't want anybody to leave here thinking that now we're gonna have motions to deny because they're not gonna pass like 99 times out of 100. A motion to deny doesn't pass and then everybody sits up here going, well, what do we do now? I, I would say make a motion to approve, but if you're gonna vote no, you have to be able to cite as to why you're voting no because that might be the decisive vote that something fails. Oh, okay, well, see that, where I was going with that is I, I'm trying to separate what the law, what the new law requires from what city council has asked of us. City council, the council has asked us for anything that we're sending to them, if anyone voted nay, they would like to know why. That's one issue, okay? Um, I, I just wanted to get clear in my mind what what the legal requirement is. I, I agree that um, if I choose, you know, if I choose to go against, the, then, you know, I should have a reason for it and I shouldn't be afraid to say why. But I was just trying to separate those, those two things, that's all. I understand with that. I just think that even if, the, even if the state law specifically said, if you make a motion to deny, it doesn't require you to make a motion to deny because those are procedural nightmares. We can be here all night making motion after motion after motion. And I just think it's unnecessary if we are having a full, open, and honest discussion on the merits of whatever the situation is. Either it meets the platting requirements and it has a recommendation of approval from staff, or it does not. Either they have all those certifications when they walk in here. It's almost ministerial at that point. They've done everything required of them, and the staff is standing before you saying on the record that it meets all of the requirements. And that's why... It requires, if you're gonna vote no on that, you have to have as good a citation and as good a reason as those that are standing before you saying it meets all of these things. 
If it does meet all the requirements, then why are we voting on it? Well, because state law says that is your job, and that's what you signed up for when you took the oath and set up here. Well, and the chances of a, a, a pigs flying are probably better, but there's always the, the always the possibility that these folks miss something. Okay, although you know my experience is they don't, but there's always that possibility. But again, the whole thing is that, and and I, I don't know if you folks ever really pay attention to the memos that staff send us, but. They'll have their recommendation, and in the very end box will tell you, here's what to consider on this thing. And so if it tells you to go to UDC 21-whatever, you go read those requirements. And, and if it meets those requirements, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it, again, it's, I, I don't really see a big, big change other than, than now, you know, they're, they're formalizing the whole if you're going to say no, you got to have a reason. So. I want more clarification. I'm not sure if we got off track from what I initially brought up, but Mr. Attorney, do you have a do you have page 72 of the of the handout where it has that chart in there? And I, I guess what I'm asking is for for things. For things like if, if I wanted to do a recess and there were only four members up here, do all four members have to agree to vote for a recess or can we just make that a simple majority to vote for a recess? Let me get to page 72. It's basically our procedure for making motions and all that kind of stuff. Weren't you on the bylaw subcommittee, Mr. Bro? Huh? Weren't you on the bylaw subcommittee? So I don't for, think for, so. Yes, you were. But that, that oh, was okay. That was okay. ages ago. Oh, okay. If, just, you just know, if, it, if it was any longer ago than a couple of weeks, <laughs> things get things get better with age. So. Right. So I would I would have no my my concern is with anything any main motions. That would be in the that would be the last one. Right, that's correct. So anything that's actual action on an item before the commission, I don't think it needs to be less than four. Okay. I'll, if y'all need a potty break, yeah, it doesn't matter to me. That's all. That's all internal procedural parliamentary stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. And if if there's a way that we could that we could adjust this, maybe maybe in some of those where it says to uh, to recess, for example, where it says yes, just change that to say majority. Mr. Chairman, could I, could I make a suggestion that this item is before us this evening because of the time requirements to meet, to implement our new rules prior, you know, prior to the, the law going into effect on the 1st of September. And staff feels that this uh, eliminating the abstention is is an important part of meeting those requirements. And my suggestion would be um, to, to move on with, with what's before us tonight and then if we feel the need, put this discussion back on the agenda at a, at a future date and go, you know, go over it then. Well, I, I think it's fairly easy. if. if I agree with the attorney that the most important one here is the last one to take action that, that we have for. I think all the other ones where it says yes, can we just make it majority? That's what the entire commission wants. And then we'll be done with it and we don't have to put it on another agenda for another meeting for a later date. Well, if, if that's the, the discussion point, then I guess you know, Either, either Mr. Outlaw or Mr. Bro make a make a motion, and we'll take it from there. So, I, I mean, I would, I would encourage y'all to really look at that list, and I will support Mr. Outlaw's suggestion that 
y'all go back, take a look, let us put this item back on for a commissioner-led discussion. I mean, these are your bylaws, but basically you're asking to put a motion to, for postponement, which is an actionable motion as not requiring four votes. That should be one that probably requires the four votes. Uh, you know, just kind of functionally as I'm looking through these. We have a running list of things to put on future agendas that never make it to future agendas, so. <laughs> okay, well. That's, that's why I brought it up today. So. Yeah, and, and you know, Mr. Burrell, you probably don't want to hear this, but you're welcome to draft something and send it in to us like was done when the bylaw commission came through. I mean, if you're just waiting around for staff to fix the bylaws, I think everybody's going to acknowledge there's more important items and much bigger fish than. I think the difference. Well, this, this wouldn't have come up if you hadn't put it in front of my face. It would be, would be, <laughs> you know, motions that are procedural in nature for the operation of the commission is one thing, but yep. no dispositive, no motions or, or actions that would be dispositive of the item before them. So whether those fall under main motions or anywhere else on that chart, I mean, I think that's where the concern for me comes in, is if it has anything to do with the disposition of the matter before the, the commission, if it's just procedural procedural matters, then it's, yeah, it's the majority of those present if we have a quorum present. So then the, only the section where it says meeting conduct motions would be applicable. The, the other two sections with disposition and main motions would yeah. not change based on your recommendation. I don't think I would change those from four. Um. And that's really my concern, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm not necessarily against what Commissioner Broad is proposing, but, you know, without really having somebody look at the impact of, of what, what making those changes would be, um, you know, I'm just afraid, I'm just afraid we're going to rush into this and then regret it down the road because we didn't think about it enough or we didn't have staff look at it and give us the potential impacts of changing these things. Well, give me a motion. I will make a motion that we, and I'm sorry, let me get back to the agenda here. Come on. I'm locked out. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, we gotta get, jump all the way back to the agenda. I'm I, I'm sorry, uh, Michael, for for holding things up here. Um, so I will make a motion that we. Uh, that the Commission recommend approval to the City Council on of the amendment to the Planning and Zoning Commission bylaws as presented this evening. Just to clarify, as presented by staff? Yes, as presented by staff. All right, I have a motion to make a recommendation to approve the amendments by Commissioner Outlaw. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Ray. Any other comments? All right, call for a vote. Aye. 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 Six ayes, no nays. Motion carries. Next item, request and announcements. Uh, let's throw a couple of things out. I uh, stopped by the Stay Bridge Suites this last, past week and was fortunate enough that they offered me a grand tour of the whole facility. If you haven't been over there, it's a very nice facility. It's quality. They still have a few things they're tightening up, but uh, they told me that they're running 95% capacity, so that's good for us and good for the city. Uh, and the other thing, I stopped by the, the new restaurant under construction next to Starbucks, the, uh, the pho place, and talked to the, the owner and he was very complimentary of our inspections and planning department. So that was a surprise to me and 
kudos to our inspection and planning department. Anyone else? You'd be surprised what I hear. <laughs> All right. Mr. Outlaw? Well, what I'm thinking is that Commissioner, maybe Commissioner Broad and I get together um, sometime, uh, maybe over lunch or, or something, and go through this whole, uh, the voting matrix, and, and see if we could come up with uh, something that we could submit then, uh, not so much to staff, but probably through staff to the, to the city attorney to get their take on the whole thing. I really don't want to lay anything off. You know, staff is busy enough as it is, but I think, um, and we don't want to get a quorum together, but uh, if, if Commissioner Broad is, is, is amenable to that, and, and of course, if somebody else wants to join us, uh, because I agree, looking at that, I, I'm not sure that we should always need the four votes, but I just like to spend some time thinking and discussing that that's all. Y'all holler at me, and I'll even buy the lunch if you come downtown. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, looking at Emily, I think we've got a pretty light agenda next time. So if, if it helps, if that's the case, again, maybe the way to do it to get everybody is we'll put it on the agenda. If there's not much else on, then you can take a pretty good amount of time. Everybody can kind of come with their thoughts. City attorney can think about it more. Be prepared for we can double check what the the UDC says anywhere and things like that and maybe you can knock it out as a group fairly quickly for what it's worth and then we don't run afoul of who's meeting and who's talking and who's Evan yeah what do you think Dan I mean th th that that's acceptable to me if it's a uh, you know uh, if it's acceptable to the rest of the commissioners I just like to know you know, that if we change uh, a particular vote requirement from four, you know, from that yes to that no, what are what is the potential impact? And then, you know, so, uh, I mean, if, if staff's willing to do that, okay, is that? Uh, th I think that would be fine. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, just uh, on the announcements portion, uh, uh, just let everybody know I did attend the council meeting last night, the budget workshop. Uh, spoke up pretty passionately about the need for an initial planner in the planning department. Uh, we'll see if that gets any traction somewhere down the road. All right, announcements by staff. One site plan to talk about tonight it is for UFP shirts a lot one block one of the proposed UFP shirt subdivision on 2252 it is a proposed 4,418 square foot break room so it's right here this is all their existing facility and all they're trying to do right now is add in a break room for their current employees to have a place to go and eat lunch and all of that that's it all right does anybody have anything else going once twice meeting adjourned 753